Hi, everyone, and welcome to a very special live here on YouTube. I'm your host, Robbie Lockie, co-founder and co-director of Plant Based News. Uh, today is a very special episode and live and supported by our amazing friends over at Compliment. They, uh, we are co-hosts of the Planta Pelosa Longevity Online Festival, and you can claim your free VIP ticket by going to the link in the description below or in the pinned comment, which is plnt.news forward slash longevity. Uh, today's host is the amazing amazing and legendary Rip Esselstyn. He has spent a decade as one of the premier athletes in the world. Uh, he th then joined the Austin Fire Department where he introduced his passion for whole food plant-based diets to the Austin um, to Austin's Engine 2 Firehouse in order to rescue a firefighting brother's health. Uh, to document his, his success, he wrote the national best-selling book, The Engine 2 Diet, which shows the irrefutable connection between a plant-based diet and good health. And he's also featured in the incredible documentary, one of the documentaries that actually turned me plant-based, uh, Forks Over Knives. And he's also, of course, the founder of Plant, plant Strong. So without further ado, please welcome Mr. Rip Esselstyn. Hey, Robbie. Well, Good to be with you. Well, welcome to the show, Rip. Great to have you here. Yes, it's great to be here. And uh, you're across the pond, right? In England right now. <laughs> yes. Is that right? Yes, uh, I'm actually in Berlin at the moment, um, over here doing some training, uh, so I'll be here for a week. But yes, I'm, you'll mostly find me uh, in sunny South London. Got it. What are you training for, Robbie? Uh, I'm training uh, and doing some work in campaigning, so uh, digital training, not physical training, though oh, I do okay. need to uh, get more into some physical training. Um, a few of my friends have challenged me to do some marathons next year, so uh, I'll, uh, I'll definitely be doing some swimming, swimming and running and cycling pretty soon. Right on, right on. Okay. So without for, further ado, please do uh, introduce yourself. Uh, please tell the audience uh, who you are and, and a little bit about your plant-based journey. How did you discover this lifestyle? Well, thank you, Robbie. Um, for those of you that don't know the backstory, um, so I was incredibly inspired by my father and his groundbreaking research at the famed Cleveland Clinic um, going back to 1984. And he decided in 1984 that heart disease was more than likely a toothless paper uh, tiger that need never exist. And if it does exist, it, can, uh, it has the potential to be stopped in its track, tracks or even reversed. And so he went about this. This is before anybody else had really dove into the, the research. I mean, this had been done with green monkeys yeah. uh, where they were able to show you could reverse heart disease by changing what these green monkeys ate. But that was about it. And he kind of was on a parallel path with, with Dr. Dean Ornish as well. And they didn't even know about each other for several years. But I saw what my father was doing with these walking dead um, heart disease patients that the Cleveland Clinic cardiology department sent him. And he ended up with about 22 of them. And again, end stage heart disease means you've got about one year or less to live. And these patients were at the end of their ropes. They've been turned away for another bypass or angioplasty or you know, no more stents. And they had no other recourse but to basically do something as drastic and radical as eat a whole food, plant-based diet. And this is way before this was even a thing. And my father got just phenomenal results, uh, Robbie and, and gang. And um, within about four years, he was able to actually show proof of concept mm. that heart disease was, in fact, um, not only preventable but reversible. All of his patients were alive five years later, 10 years later, 15, 20 years later. And then when they started to die, they weren't dying of heart disease or cancer. They were dying of, of other things like from old age and in your 90s. So pretty phenomenal. You know, he's been written up in about seven different peer reviewed pieces of med medical literature. He has uh the most profound before and after angiographic evidence which is where you go in and you shoot a die and you can basically see the blockages he has he's got the most profound before and after angiographic evidence on the planet showing uh, how this disease can be reversed 
and he's done it multiple, multiple times. So really just a uh, groundbreaking, you know, um, scientist and physician with heart disease. So I was inspired by his, his research. And when I graduated from the University of Texas at Austin in 1987, where I was eating horrendously on the athletic training table with the football <laughs> players, the basketball players. What age were you then, Rip? I was 19 to 22. Right. So this, so at 19, this is when your dad, your father was doing this research. He started it when I was 19. Exactly. Right. Okay. And, it's just and, interesting and, for context of your yeah. and what life stage you were on. Because at 19, we're often not really wanting to listen to family and, you know, like young teenage, late teenage years, uh, listening to what our parents are doing. So it's a, uh, it's definitely an inspirational story, but, but I'll let you continue. Let, let's hear more about how his work influenced you in the, as you move forward. Yeah. But, you know, but to your point, Robbie, about um, my father and a lot of people have asked me, so you didn't rebel against it. And I'm like, you know, I didn't rebel whatsoever. I've always been such a fan of my father. Um, he's always been one of the great heroes in my life. You know, for those that don't know, he won, he won an Olympic gold medal in 1956 in Ador, uh, in the Ador crew in Melbourne, Australia. He won a bronze star in Vietnam uh, as a MASH surgeon you know, out in the field. Um, he's just, uh, he's a heck of a man, right? And he's got a heck of a, uh, heck of a set of values. And so super, super proud to have him as my father. So I was eating at the, athletic. yeah, in, in college, I was eating on the athletic training table, just, you know, chicken fried steak, steaks, cheeseburgers, pizza, you know, uh, all the ice cream that you could eat. Uh, there was really no no salads, no green leafies, no like healthy unprocessed carbohydrates really to speak of. And so as soon as I got off the training table and uh, I graduated from U UT, I immediately started eating this way. And it, this is what fueled me from really from 1987 until today as a as an athlete. You know, I spent the next 10 years as a professional triathlete. Uh, swimming, biking, and running, and gallivanting all over the globe, competing, fueling myself with the, with the power of whole plant-based foods to really make me as lean and mean as I could be, give me an immune system where I very, very rarely got sick. Uh, it allowed me to recover so much quicker. And as we all know, you know, when you're an athlete and you are, you get your heart rate up and you're breathing a lot, you have a tendency to develop more free radicals. Mm. And so I want to do everything that I could to mitigate that free radical buildup. And of course, the best way to do that is with whole plant-based foods that have 64 times more antioxidants than animal, uh, animal based foods. They've got, you know, somewhere in the neighborhood plants do of 15 to 20,000 known phytonutrients, plant nutrients that are there to prevent oxidative stress, DNA damage, and all this jazz. So um, I loved it. I loved eating this way. Um, I love training really, really hard and testing my body every day. And it, uh, it totally worked for me. And then as a firefighter, uh, you know, I use this to fuel me as a firefighter, as a husband, as a father. Uh, and I'll stop there and let you chime in. Robbie. <laughs> I was going to ask, obviously, at that time, and I always I love to ask my guests this question and considering, you know, the, the time span of your of your transition. Um, this isn't you know, this is this was a time where veganism and plant based living was something that wasn't really on the mainstream. So what was it like at the time when you were you and your family were kind of being trailblazers in this way of eating and living? How much kind of pushback and how much, I suppose, negativity did you get from family, the community, people around you? You know, um, was it did you get support or, or was there sort of people telling you that you were uh, crazy? <laughs> well, it depends upon the crowd you're hanging out with. I can tell you as a firefighter it was a hostile environment to be um, to be a firefighter in the capital of mm. Texas, Austin, wow. uh, which is, you know, I mean, Texas is, it's the land of beef. 
Stank and these central. fire, oh, oh yeah, <laughs> and these firefighters have this mentality uh, that is very. It's this toxic masculinity, especially when it comes to the food, and and what that food represents. Uh, so, I got a lot of pushback and a lot of resistance from the firefighters, but. Fortunately, I was I was 33 when I got on with the Austin Fire Department. So I was old enough uh, that I had a thick skin. I didn't care one lick what anybody said to me or what they thought of me, because I knew in my heart that this was the best way, the healthiest way, the, the way that aligned most with all of my values for me to eat. So it, it and over time and it took time, but over time, I earned the respect and I think even the admiration of those firefighters. And, yep. you know, it wasn't until I launched my first book, The Engine 2 Diet, that, and I, you know, and I was fortunate enough to be on the morning shows, you know, the Today Show on NBC, the CBS Morning Show, uh, Good Morning America. All of a sudden, it gave me credibility in the eyes of all these firefighters. And, you know, maybe Rip is onto something. And before you know it, instead of being the ones that were mocked and, and we got made fun of, like you would not believe of by the, uh, the other fire stations, all of a sudden there's pockets of fire stations all over the department. And we had about 51 fire stations that are doing the, the engine two plan strong, you know, uh, regiment. Uh, in fact, the in-house physician for the Austin, uh, fire department, he sees every firefighter every year and he gives you a full physical. So total blood work, blood pressure, you know, weighs you, um, the whole, the whole thing. And you wouldn't believe how many firefighters, not only in Austin, but across the country are overweight, pre-diabetic, hypertensive. They're, they're, they're a mess and it's because of the food, right? It's the food, it's the food, it's the food. Mm. And so he, when I came out with the book, he read the book. He, he, he did the 28 day challenge himself and he dropped 14 pounds. His total cholesterol dropped 80 points. His LDL dropped 50 points. And he looked at the research. He was like, this is totally legit. And now on the prescription pads, when, you know, people have, are hypertensive, pre-diabetic, he writes down the engine two diet, right? Read the engine two diet by rip. So, I mean, you talk about a total flip flop from a um, a group, a demographic that had no interest in hearing this message. And mm -hmm. in fact, you know, wanted to throw me out uh, on my tail. <laughs> and now all of a sudden, you know, there it, it kind of makes sense. And that's just one small example. Right. Mm -hmm. With the fire department. And I could go on with you know, triathletes, friends, family, all those things. It's amazing. So let's, for those that don't know, uh, tell us a bit, a bit about what it was like being a, a firefighter, because um, it's a pretty complex job and it actually re requires a fair bit of strength as well. Um, thing, bad things happen and one has to be physically ready uh, for this. Um, whilst you're speaking, uh, there's a photo of you somewhere in your in your uh, firefighting outfits. I'm sure I'll, I can bring it up on the screen so people can see. But, you know, tell us a bit about your experience and what it was like being a firefighter and why having a diet that made sure that you were physically fit and healthy was absolutely essential. Yeah, I mean, so <clears throat> let me let me backtrack for a sec here, Robbie, and just let you know that the number one cause of in the line of duty deaths for firefighters is heart attacks. Wow. And more so than any other profession on the planet, firefighters are dying of heart disease. And one of the main reasons is because they are fueling themselves with weak food instead of strong food, right? They're, they're doing all the fried foods. They're doing, you know, bacon, fajitas, cheese, pepperoni, pizzas. Uh, it's like the standard American diet on steroids. It, it wow. truly is. So that's, that's part one. Part two is this is a profession where you go from lying in your lazy boy recliner, you know, watching reruns <laughs> of uh, the Andy Griffith show to all of a sudden you've got a four alarm apartment fire and you're throwing on your your bunker gear. You're putting on your air pack. 
And then you got to go figure out how best to either, you know, vent this building or go in, put it out, get people out of the building. And your heart goes from beating, you know, 50, 60 beats per minute to 180, 200 beats per minute. Wow. And the unfortunate truth is that this puts an insane amount of stress on that, uh, on that heart muscle. And so you want to be, you want to be a superhero. And unfortunately, most of these firefighters, they're, they've become more of a liability than an asset to their crews because of the typical firefighter diet that is absolutely toxic to your health and your performance. And, you know, when somebody picks up that phone call and they dial 911 because they've got an emergency, they expect a world-class athlete that can, you know, dive through their window and save their asses. Wow. And unfortunately... Superhuman, more like. <laughs> superhuman. And unfortunately, more than not, you know, these, these firefighters are, um, are, not on, are not on top of their game. And, you know, we all know that the best way to feel yourself, to be lean, to be mean, and to be muscular, to be strong, uh, to be at the top of your game, especially after the great thing about eating this way, Robbie, is that when you eat a whole food plant based diet and you get done eating, you don't feel like you've got a, a bowling ball in the middle of your stomach. And the last thing you want to do is run out the door and do the hardest marathon of your of your life which is going into a bear a burning building but when you eat whole food plant-based let's say you have rice and beans and a veggie extravaganza on top and a little bit of uh, a salsa and a uh, little spray of bragg's liquid aminos and some guacamole you know what you are like mm. all right i'm good to go i'm not gonna have to i'm not gonna barf in my face mask right <laughs> uh when uh, when things get ugly so mm. Just for a multitude of reasons, uh, it makes it makes sense for firefighters to shed mm. shed the old skin, the old yep. you know, masculine skin that is not doing anything for them, or to make them better firefighters, or to make them more manly, mm. and, uh, and and try on this new skin that actually wears quite well, and will make them much more of a man. Robbie, I like to say that you know if you really so. You, we all know that one of the first signs of heart disease in men is an underperforming penis, right? And that, that's the that's the canary in the coal mine is, and it's because that artery to the male penis is one fifth the size of the arteries that are going to our heart and up into our brains, mm. and so it kind of lets you know. And this is why so many men in our country have erectile dysfunction. And so I like to say, if you want to slay. And, just, and pretend I'm talking, let's say you're a firefighter. I say, Robbie, if you want to slay that erectile dysfunction dragon, and the reason I use that, that analogy is because the thing that firefighters love to do, they, they refer to fighting a fire as slaying the dragon. Let's go mm. in there and slay that dragon. So if you yeah. want to slay that erectile dysfunction dragon and allow your puff, the magic dragon, to roar, keep playing. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's such a good analogy and you know i, I was really interesting that you, know, you were referencing the heart you know the heart is the center of our, our our kind of our life force really it keeps us going it's beating hundreds of times thousands of times a day um and if it isn't at peak performance you know when we're going into situations like that that are incredibly dangerous uh we're putting our body under huge stress and if our arteries aren't operating at peak performance we are putting ourselves at a huge disservice. And I imagine like even today, you know, after even all these years, a lot of firefighters who aren't potentially at peak performance when it comes to our, you know, arterial function. But let's let's talk a bit about like obviously you worked in the in the fire and um in your fire department and you obviously saw there was a problem and you you created the engine two diet. Um, yeah. give us a bit of a history lesson of what happened with that. Like how was it received and talk us through like the changes and, and actually what happened when when this uh way of eating was starting to be picked up by your peers. Yeah. So, Robbie, I love talking about this. Uh, so I was working with these guys at my fire station for a good six years before anyone decided to take notice and make some changes. 
and there was a catalyst. There was one huge catalyst that took place, and that was one of my fellow firefighting brothers had his cholesterol checked at the age of 33, and it was 344. And, you know, Robbie, for people that are not sure, you know, here in the States, we measure cholesterol milligrams per deciliter. And the average American has a cholesterol somewhere between 200 and 250 milligrams per deciliter. And 51% of Americans will perish from heart disease. Doesn't matter if you're male or female, wow. black or white, doesn't discriminate. And so this particular individual at 33 with a cholesterol of 344, he then told us that his father had triple bypass at 49 and his grandfather and his great grandfather died before the age of 50 from heart attack. So he had a genetic predisposition to this disease and he was a self-proclaimed third generation redneck, which he said means that almost every meal, whether it's breakfast, lunch, or dinner, I has to have a piece of a big old honking piece of meat on it. Otherwise it doesn't qualify as a meal and preferably deep fried. So that's just so, so you understand what we're dealing with here. So oh. he, he, he knew how I had been eating. I mean, I'd been a firefighter with him for six years and I gathered the guys up. And I said, Hey, well, you know what? Just give this, give this, give this a serious try for 28 days and eat the way I eat. And don't only do it when you're at the fire station, but also do it at home. And then let's see what happens. So all these guys in an act of solidarity. And I want you to know, Robbie, this is like an extended family. And I spend, you know, you spend so much time with your firefighter, firefighting brothers and sisters. So they are like an extended family. And everybody jumped in. And so we started a, um, a board and we would keep track of whose turn it was to to, uh, to buy the food and decide what the meal was going to be. And it had to be plant-based. And then we would all chip in at this during, you know, while we're at the station to, to chop and prep and cook for the meal and then wash the dishes. So it was a real team effort, except for going to the grocery store and deciding what the meal was. That was up to whoever's turn it was to, um, to basically buy the groceries. And 28 days later, this guy's cholesterol dropped from 344 to 198. So it dropped 146 points. His weight dropped 14 pounds. His um, acid reflux went away, sleeping better. Um, blood pressure came down. All these, you know, all these tangible and intangible things happened. And this was in 2003. And then we were off to the races. This became a thing that we were doing. And... Um, yeah. And then, you know, we got written up in the New York Times and the local papers and did all kinds of uh, radio interviews. And then I was solicited to write a book and um, it took me about two and a half years to write my first book, but I did it. But in doing that first book, just to dive deeper into your question, I had a group of six, 72 people that were guinea pigs that did this for 28 days. And the average weight loss for men was 14 the average weight loss for women was nine and a half pounds. The wow. average drop in cholesterol was almost 40 points. The average drop in LDL was 25. Triglycerides were 24. And blood pressure was 10 over 5. And then Can, again, we, can we clarify yeah. here that this is a healthy, whole food, plant-based diet? Because obviously we, live, we now live in a world where vegan means animal-free, but it does not mean healthy. Uh, what you're referring to for the audience listening, and and if you please do check out Rip's books and website, this is we're talking healthy whole food plant based. Can you just clarify what that actually means? Like what kind of foods would people have been yeah. eating at that time? Because I think there's a real like uh, lack of awareness sometimes on these two things. Yeah. So you know the former um, Dr. Hans Deal liked to say that eat foods as close to grown as possible that are minimally processed. And so that's exactly what that means. So obviously the fewer ingredients, the better. Uh, we're talking fruits, all the different fruits that are out there. Fruits are magnificent. All the, all the fiber, the water, the phytonutrients, the antioxidants that are there in fruits. Um, the, the wonderful, healthy um, carbohydrates, unprocessed carbohydrates that are in fruit. And then of course you've got like your average fruit, people don't even know this, but your average fruit is six and a half, seven percent protein 
And then fruit also has fat, not a lot, but it's got fat. I'll say, so all the fruit that you want, the only exception, Robbie and, 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 and gang here, coconut. Coconut is 91% fat and it's all saturated fat. So that's the one that we recommend you stay away from. Uh, then it's, of course, you've got your vegetables. We love vegetables, right? They're so low in calories, high in nutrients, fiber, water. We really, on, on the Engine 2 plan, the Plant Strong program, we recommend you do three to up to six fist-sized servings of green leafy vegetables a day. That can be, you know, kale, Swiss chard, collard greens, spinach, arugula, um, you know, cauliflower. We love green leafies, uh, especially if you have heart disease. These green leafies are going to go in. They're going to make the inside of your arteries like Teflon instead of like Velcro and allow the, the nitric oxide, which is the gas, the, this magic gas that's produced from your endothelial cells. It'll just allow that to come to life. But again, you got to chew those green leafies. Don't drink them. You got to chew them, right? We got to masticate them the way, the way nature intended. Uh, and then, of course, we love potatoes. Come on, my gosh. Potatoes, they're so satiating. In fact, there's multiple studies that have been done showing that the potato is the most satiating food on the planet. So, and they're calorie uh, light, like 350 calories per pound. So knock yourself out. Yukon gold, russet, um, you know, sweet potatoes, love them. Those, those that are all... afraid of carbs, listen up. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And then of course, we've got all the legumes that are there. Beans, peas, lentils, you know, Dan Butner. Can't say enough good things about beans, and neither, neither can I. They're on average 25 to 30 percent protein, wonderful sort source of fiber. They're very, very satiating, very, very flavorful, especially if you use the right spices. So knock yourself out with black beans, white beans, butter beans, um, red lentils, um, split peas, um, mung beans. The list goes on and on and on when it comes to beans. Um, and then the last thing I'll say is um, uh, fruits, vegetables, whole grains, uh, whole grains. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. So, I mean, all the amazing <laughs> grains that are out there. So, you know, we love brown rice, millet, uh, farro, quinoa, um, barley. There's so many incredible grains that are out there. Teft that most people haven't even explored. And again, fantastic sources of fiber, protein complex carbohydrates, et cetera. And then limited amounts of nuts and seeds. We just don't want to make sure we're not overdoing the nuts and seeds, especially mm -hmm. if we have pre-diabetes, type two diabetes, heart disease, anything like that. Amazing. Well, some really good advice there. If you're just joining us tonight, today, this afternoon, wherever you are, I'm Robbie Lockie. This is Plant Based News. We're live here on YouTube with the amazing Rip Esselstyn, founder of Plant Strong and Engine 2. Today's live is supported by our friends at Compliment. We are co hosts of the Plantapalooza Longevity Online Festival. And you can grab your free VIP ticket if you grab the link or grab the link, click the link below in the description or the pinned comment, plnt.news forward slash longevity. On that note, let's talk about longevity because it's a word, a buzzword. It's been around a while, but it seems to be you know gaining momentum again with documentaries uh, like the yeah. documentary with um, uh, Dan Butner on the Blue Zones. Um, let's talk about the connection between plant-based diets and longevity. Um, what is the research? What does the research say? Like, what does the science say with regards like eating a whole healthy, whole food, plant based diet and the effects uh, of the longevity on, on the human body? Well, I can tell you. And again, I, I, this is not my expertise, Robbie, but I can tell you that, you know, you look at the book that's just coming out in December by um, by Dr. Michael Greger. And, you know, just to put this into perspective for you. He talks about how, you know, in his first book, How Not to Die, he had 2,000 references. In How Not to Diet, he had 4,000 scientific references to support everything he was talking about. In How Not to Age, he had 13,000 references. I mean, it's incredible. And of course, it, it makes so much sense that if you're fueling, fueling yourself with a whole food, plant-based diet that has all these, the perfect complement of macronutrients, 
carbohydrate, carbohydrates, fats, protein, and it's just exceedingly the overweight like contender when it comes to all these wonderful micronutrients like fiber, water, phytonutrients, antioxidants, uh, vitamins and minerals. It, it's just, to me, it's, it's no wonder. But the key here, Robbie, is we want to make sure that we've got, you know, we've got great longevity, but we've also got a great health span. So we've got this health span that correlates and rides right alongside with our longevity. We don't want to live a long life right? And then have a stroke back here. And then we're in a wheelchair and we're in a nursing home and for the last 10, 15 years of our life. That is no fun for any anyone. And I can tell you, having interviewed Dr. Michael Greger for his new book, and of course, having uh, Dan Butner on the show multiple times, the key is it's, it's movement. It is eating whole food plant-based. It's keeping those stressors at bay. It is socialization. All these things contribute to having a, you know, a nice, long, healthy life. And I will add to that. And it, it, like, for example, Okinawa, the Okinawans are some of the longest lived people on the planet. Robbie, I'm going to put you on the spot here. What percent protein do you think the Okinawans are eating? What percent protein? Give me Protein from plant sources or from uh, animal sources? No, in totality. In totality. In total. Yeah. Uh, um, 30%? Okay. That's a really, really awful guess. <laughs> <laughs> so the, answer, the answer is 7%. 7% of their calories are coming from protein. Most Americans think wow. that, you know, more protein is beneficial. It's not. And that's why in all of my books, I talk about how we actually – want to limit the amount of protein that we're consuming because more protein does you no benefit mm. whatsoever. And much over 10, 12%, you just pee it away or you store it as fat. Where, and so, but let me say, Rick, where does it come from? I was going to oh, say, where does this obsession from of, with protein come from? If you could include that in your answer. Well, I, I will, but first let me, let me finish my thought here. Cause I really want people yeah. to get this and, and guess where the Okinawans get almost all their protein from sweet potatoes. That's, that makes up wow. almost 77% of their daily caloric uh, consumption. It's from the Okinawan sweet potato. So 7%. So these Okinawans are literally, they're sipping on protein. When over here in the States, we're gulping down the protein. Most Americans are getting 20 to 35% of their calories from protein. And that is a real problem. And it's the wrong kind of protein. It's animal protein that siphons calcium from your bones, it's harsh on the kidneys and the liver, raises cholesterol levels, it promotes uh, inflammation in our arteries, and then lastly, especially the proteins from dairy products, actually incite the growth of tumor and cancer cells. And am I frozen on your end? Uh, no, we can still see you. Okay, good. good. Okay, good, 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 good. <laughs> so, um, and here, this, I mean, we have this, this love affair with protein and it's all marketing hype. I mean, uh, what is exactly does it go back to? I don't know, but it's probably 60 years old. And uh, you have some very, very powerful uh, lobbyists that have convinced people that, you know, you need meat. Meat's the only source of legitimate protein. And the reality is the, the most intelligent, safe Goldilocks form of protein, Robbie, comes from whole plant-based proteins, which is where all protein originates from. Right. I mean, there's basically nine, nine different essential amino acids, isoleucine, leucine, lysine, methionine, phenylalanine, tryptophan, threonine, valine, and histidine. <laughs> and they are in the perfect composition and proportion in Amazing. all whole plant-based foods. Like people have to get over the protein fixation. <laughs> I know there's a real there's a real kind of obsession with animal protein because there's a lot of a, there's a misnomer that uh, animal protein is a, is a whole protein and that you can't get all the proteins you need from plants. But of course, as we know, you can get all your plant, uh, proteins from plants if you have a diversity of plants in your diet. But uh, I do want to um, give some time to the audience. There are a few questions, if I may pop one on the screen. Obviously, you fitness is a huge part of your life, and perhaps you can answer this question for Marathon 5 one 
5150. They say, I run 80 to 100 miles a week, but what? But would like to keep sodium in check. What should I be stri striving for? So I suppose sodium is in salt and salt in foods. Should people who are yeah, athletes keep sodium low? Yeah, well, that's a great question. And, you know, there's sodium in all foods. And, you know, the the um, the minimum amount of sodium that we want on a daily basis is 500 milligrams per day. Most Americans are getting 3,500 to 5,000. And that's why almost 50% of American adults are taking some sort of a hypertensive medication. Uh, but if, he, if you're running 80 to uh, 100 um, uh, miles a week, and he's trying to keep your sodium in check. I would just see, like, ask you how you're feeling. What's your blood pressure like? And, uh, you know, are your energy levels sustained? I mean, 80 to 100 miles a week is, that's significant. And um, obviously, when you're running that much, you're probably consuming more food. Uh, but to me, the human body is so magnificent. And I bet you that your body knows exactly how to kind of self-regulate that. Um, but I would just say, um, what's your blood pressure? How's your energy? And, um, and then kind of let that be your gauge as far as if you need to add sodium or remove some sodium. Amazing. Uh, the next question is from Dan Ray Rayleigh, who says, what is it in animal protein that causes the increase in blood acidity? Is that related to oxidation of the blood? So with the animal protein, um, it's the sulfuric containing uh, essential amino acids that um, that animal proteins are high in. And uh, for example, um, methionine, right? Most, most uh, animal proteins are high in methionine. And then this turns into homocysteine, which is, promotes inflammation and, uh, and acidity. So that's just kind of one example. Whereas the beauty in plant-based proteins is they're like, they're just dialed into the perfect level uh, of almost all nine of these essential amino acids. And just so people understand, they're called essential because you can't get them from your food and your body can't manufacture them on your own. You have to get them from the food. Um, and again, whether it's black beans, whether it's watermelon, spinach, uh, sweet potatoes, they have the perfect proportion and composition of all nine. You don't need to worry about doing the com the combining and all this nonsense. I see a question here from IV. I'd love to answer that one, right? If you're an athlete, you see that one? Yeah. Yeah. So you, you want to read that to me? Uh, yes. Where has it gone? It's disappeared. Oh, there we go. Uh, yeah. Uh, it's, uh, so, but how about if you're an athlete and exercising three to four hours, four to five days a week surely you get more than seven percent intake of vegan protein so here's something that people aren't aren't going to probably like my answer <laughs> but you know i performed at a world-class level doing triathlons for over tw almost 25 years and i didn't once count or measure or weigh my food and the last thing i did was worry about how many grams of protein i was getting and the reason is because I inherently knew that all the protein that I needed was just there in the beans, in the potatoes, in the rice, and all that stuff. And I let my weight be my guide as to whether I needed to eat more or not. And I love to race at about 170 pounds. Uh, I don't know what that is in kilos. Just divide that by 2.2. But 170 pounds. And I knew when I got down to 166, I need to really start eating more. And just by eating more, so if you're working out, IV, three to four hours a day, four to five days a week, I guarantee you that you're eating, your appetite has increased as well. And just to give you an example, just by eating one extra piece of Ezekiel 4.9 bread or toast, that's seven grams of protein. Just by consuming an extra two ounces of red lentil pasta, that could be 20 grams of protein because it's so concentrated in those red lentils. If it's just a whole grain pasta, it's another seven grams of protein. One third of a can of black beans is seven grams. 
So if you just, because you're exercising that much more, if you just have one extra piece of toast, two extra uh, ounces of whole grain pasta, and a third, right, a third of a can of, of black beans, you've just got 21 grams of protein without blinking an eye. So again, as long as you're eating enough, my bet is you're getting all the protein you need and, mm. um, and your weight is where you want it. Amazing. I think we've got time for uh, one more question, uh, which is from Plant Powered Certified Nutrition Coach. And thank you for all your comments. Um, and they've asked, what does Rip eat in a day for his training? So what does your average eating uh, look like when, you, when you're doing training and you've done training in the past? Yeah. So, you know, it doesn't necessarily look any different than how I normally eat. Um, when I'm training, the only thing that differs is I eat more. So today I've already had, and it's, it's about noon here, so I haven't had lunch yet. But to give you an idea, uh, yesterday, for example, um, I, played, I, I swam for an hour in the morning, and then I played an hour and a half of pickleball at night. But I had my big bowl of cereal in the morning. This is a commercialized cereal that I, that I make. It's got four different types of whole grain cereals in it. And then it's also got um, some date pieces in it and some um, and some banana. And to that, I added a sliced banana, frozen mango chunks, and um, and an apple. And then also some hemp seeds and some ground flaxseed meal for my omega threes. And then I put on that some really really clean oat milk. So that was my breakfast. Then about three hours later, I had another banana. Then for lunch, I had a leftover enchilada casserole that my wife my that my wife made for dinner the previous night. So I just had that, and uh, and then for dinner last night it was um, a rice and beans dish. It was brown rice, black beans, and then on top of that, I did I did onions, I did uh, I did salsa. I did uh, water chestnuts. Uh, I did uh, red and yellow bell peppers, uh, some avocado slices, and uh, and salsa. And then during the day, between the banana, between lunch and dinner, and like lunch and um, lunch and dinner, I probably had a total of six or seven different pieces of fruit. I love bananas. I love kiwis, um, apples, oranges, pears. Whatever's in season, I usually have a whole bucket of them lying around the house. So there you go. Amazing. Brilliant, Rip. I think that's all we've got time for. But thank you so much for your time. And thank you for sharing your wisdom and your a bit of your experience as well. And uh, those who want to hear more and learn more, please do join us at the Plants Below's a Longevity uh, online festival where Mr. Rip Esselstyn will be speaking in more detail. So thank you so much for joining us today. It's been an absolute pleasure. Loved it, Robbie. Anytime. Thanks so much. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Thanks for joining us, everyone. I've been your host, Robbie Lockie, and uh, this is Plant Based News. If you enjoyed that uh, and you want to watch it back, uh, please do check out our YouTube channel where the episode will be available to rewatch. And please drop your comments and questions below, and we do our best to get back to as many of you as possible. I hope you enjoyed that episode. As always, please comment, like, and share. Uh, and if you are on um, podcasting as well, if you love podcasting, please do check out the PBN podcast and our website for daily views and news on the plant-based revolution. Uh, and of course, please do check us out on all the social media channels forward slash plant-based news. Thank you so much for joining us and uh, have a fantastic day.